Let me just begin this uh, centennial event honoring Dr. Sakharov uh, by noting that in a resolution uh, that will be introduced in the United States Senate today by Senators Bob Menendez and Jim Risch, who are the chair, the chair and ranking member respectively of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, this, the Senate will say, whereas the Nobel Peace Prize Committee called Dr. Sakharov the spokesman for the conscience of mankind. And it also notes that Dr. Sakharov's courageous efforts against Soviet totalitarianism inspired political reforms that swept Europe in 1989. Uh, and the Senate finally notes and resolves that Sakharov's example has inspired millions around the world working to promote democratic principles. Uh, and I think what the Senate is gonna be saying today when this resolution is passed and adopted uh, is what really is, lies behind all of us and what we're uh, thinking about Dr. Sakharov today and his significance for the struggle for a better world. I wanna begin by calling on uh, Tatiana Yankalevich, who is the daughter of the late um, Elena Bonner and uh, Dr. Sakharov's widow um, and the stepdaughter of Dr. Sakharov. And she is formerly the director of the Sakharov Program on Human Rights at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. Uh, and Tatiana is an independent scholar associated with the Davis Centers. Tatiana, it's just a great honor and a pleasure to have you with us this morning. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you, everyone uh, present. Uh, it's great to see old friends and to, uh, to find new ones uh, through this uh, modern uh, and uh, uh, completely, uh, hopefully soon, completely unnecessary means. Uh, I would like to share some memories with you on this occasion. One of the most uh, moving memories I have was of standing uh, in the Rose Garden uh, behind Ronald Reagan as he signed the proclamation 5063 uh, in observance of National Andrei Sakharov Day. That proclamation read, Dr. Andrei Sakharov has earned the admiration and gratitude of the people of the United States and other countries throughout the world for his tireless and courageous efforts on behalf of international peace and on behalf of basic human freedoms for the peoples of the Soviet Union. In recognition of this work, Dr. Sakharov was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. Soviet authorities prevented Dr. Sakharov from receiving this award in person by prohibiting him from leaving the Soviet Union. In the face of continuous harassment and mistreatment by the Soviet authorities, Dr. Sakharov has continued his work for peace and individual human rights. Despite his exile to the remote city of Borky on January 22nd, 1980, and despite continued efforts by the Soviet authorities to deny Dr. Sakharov the means of continuing his work and of maintaining contact with the outside world, the example of Andrei Sakharov's courage continues to shine brightly. The Congress, by Senate Joint Resolution 51, has designated May 21, 1983, as National Andrei Sakharov Day and has authorized and requested the President to issue a proclamation in observance of that day. On this occasion, Americans everywhere are given the opportunity to reaffirm that despite attempts at repression, the ideals of peace and freedom will endure and ultimately triumph. Now, therefore, I, Ronald Reagan, President of the United States of America, do hereby proclaim May 21st, 1983, as National Andre Sakharov Day. I call upon the American people to observe that day with appropriate ceremonies and activities. Signed, Ronald Reagan. Two years later, President Reagan designated May 21st, 1985, the Andrei Sakharov Day, saying 
the human rights situation in the Soviet Union remains weak. And he will sign the proclamation that declared, we renew our call to the new Soviet leadership to end the isolation of Dr. Sakharov and his wife. He asked that my mother, Elena Bonner, be permitted to travel abroad for needed medical care for heart problems. And he added, let all who cherish Dr. Sakharov's noble values, both governments and individuals, continue to press the Soviets for information about the Sakharovs and for an end to Soviet persecution of two of its most distinguished citizens. A year a year later, my mother was finally allowed to travel to the United States for the life-saving open-heart surgery. President Reagan sent her a letter of encouragement and good wishes for her return trip to her husband and to eternal exile. Uh, dated May 14, 1986, this letter read, Dear Mrs. Bonner, Americans and others dedicated to the cause of human dignity will be celebrating May 21st as Andrei Sakharov Day. As you prepare to return to your homeland, I want you to know how much we respect and admire Academician Sakharov's and your own courage and dedication. Dr. Sakharov's scientific achievements, his contributions to peace, and efforts on behalf of democratic human rights are an inspiration to all mankind. Although Dr. Sakharov remains isolated in Borky, the world has not forgotten this. It can never do so. I hope you will take back to Dr. Sakharov reassurance that we will continue to do everything possible to secure his freedom and to advance the principles for which he has sacrificed so much. Sincerely, Ronald Reagan. Over the most hopeless and dramatic years, my family experienced compassion and active assistance from the varied milieu of persons genuinely concerned with the violations of human rights, wherever they may have been taking place. Many of these people were members of the U.S. Congress. The plight of my parents may have been exceptional, but the concern for them also helped bring to the fore the fate of other victims of uh, injustice and discrimination. Andrei Sakharov believed that human rights ideology is the only ideology that can unite the world as it transcends the divisions imposed by party, church, confession, gender, ethnicity, and race. His conviction was confirmed by the nonpartisan collaboration of the US statesman on behalf of human rights in the past. My hope is that this will continue in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, and you know, as we think about Dr. Sakharov today, we live in a very, very troubled world and uh, remembering him will help us deal with some of the challenges that we face. We're now, we, we have messages now, video messages, uh, short ones, but very important ones from two of Dr. Sakharov's closest associates in the struggle for human rights uh, in the Soviet Union. The first is from Lev Ponomarev, who uh, helped established memorial the, uh, in, uh, in 1998, the International Human Rights Organization. And following Dr. Sakharov's death on December 14th, 1989, uh, Lev, who is a great friend of the, uh, of the NED, NED, Lev filled Dr. Sakharov's place in the Congress of People's Deputies. And the second message is from Sergei Kovalyov, who established in 1969, the Action Group for the Defense of Human Rights which was the first human rights organization in the Soviet Union. Uh, he was arrested in 1970, 1974 and spent 10 years in labor camps uh, and, in and in exile in the Russian Far East. Uh, and in the 1990s, he served as the chair of the president's, in, in, Ru in Russia, the president's human rights commission. And in 1995, I just wanna note proudly that the NED presented him 
uh, and it was John McCain, Senator John McCain, who gave the award, presented um, Sergei Kovalyov and Elena Bonner together uh, with the NEDS uh, Democracy Award. So without further ado, we're going to hear these two messages from Lev Ponomaryov and Sergei Kovalyov. В условиях, когда огромная страна с колоссальными ресурсами, ядерным арсеналом и внешнеполитическими амбициями снова разворачивает массовые репрессии, когда она открыто демонстрирует готовность избивать политических оппонентов и ведет подрывную деятельность в соседних странах. Недостаточно просто вспомнить Сахарова. Сегодня отметить его заслуги и личные качества. Связка, мир, прогресс и права человека требует реальных действий. Именно в год столетия Сахарова мы говорим о важности восстановления диалога как средство сохранения мира в отношении Запада с Россией. Нужен прорыв, и не исключено, что нужно вырабатывать новый нестандартный подход. Как бы это ни прозвучало сегодня, но Запад действительно многое может предложить России. Но мирное существование в принципе невозможно без реального прогресса в вопросе защиты прав человека внутри страны. Это главный урок, который был извлечен из ужаса Второй мировой войны. Именно так появилась Декларация прав человека ООН и Европейская конвенция по защите прав человека и основных свобод. Ключевым требованием в диалоге с Россией должно стать выполнение обязательств по защите прав внутри страны, освобождение Алексея Навального и других политических заключенных, восстановление гарантий честных выборов. Я уверен, что Запад сегодня располагает средствами для того, чтобы добиться выполнения этих требований. До сих пор в в переговорах с Россией Запад действовал сугубо прагматично. Но в год столе Андрея Сахарова уместно вспомнить его слова. В конечном итоге нравственный выбор оказывается самым прагматичным. Именно такой выбор должен сделать Запад сегодня. Два фундаментально важных тезиса Сахарова были о том, что человечество может выжить лишь преодолев политическую разобщенность. И что этого не случится без соблюдения прав человека и, в первую очередь, интеллектуальной свободы. Именно это утверждение о невозможности преодолеть раскол без демократизации общественной жизни и без обеспечения интеллектуальной свободы было принципиально новым в его размышлениях. И потому Сахаров стал правозащитником. Свобода мысли – качество, которым в необыкновенной степени обладал Андрей Дмитриевич, делало его неуязвимым для страха. А глядя на него, освобождались от страха и другие. Но Сахаров не был бы Сахаровым, если бы поставив задачу не предложил решение. Прекратить преследование инакомыслящих. Объявить амнистию политическим. Отменить цензуру. Смечить государственную монополию в экономике. Ввести более сбалансированную и менее агрессивную внешнюю политику. Казалось бы, в этих предложениях не было ничего угрожающего основам строя. Но 20 лет спустя Горбачев попытался осуществить именно эту программу. И решим рухнул. Новое мышление или новая нравственность, говорят о Сахаре. Да нет же, самая обыкновенная человеческая нравственность которая уже более двух тысяч лет, только очень последовательная и старая, как мир мышления, то есть основанная на разуме. У Сахарова была совесть, и у него был разум. Этих двух качеств 
не хватает России сегодня. Она отринула его наследие. Нет у России проблем, с которыми она сталкивается внутри или за рубежом. Она сама и есть проблема. Подполковник КГБ в президентах. Нынешние законы об экстремизме, о защите прав верующих, закон Димы Яковлева, о досудебном блокировании веб-сайтов, об иностранных агентах, о чем там еще. Разгром независимых СМИ, бешеный разгул лживой и злобной пропаганды в государственных каналах, отторжение грузинской территории, аннексия Крыма, разжигание гражданской войны в Украине. Есть у кого-нибудь сомнения, как отнес бы к этому Сахаров? Сахарову было бы стыдно. Мне стыдно. Нам должно быть стыдно. Thank you both, Lev and uh, Sergey, for those wonderful remarks. And now we're going to turn to our program, and it's appropriate that we begin with another person who worked extremely closely with Dr. Sakharov as a young man, Natan Sharansky, uh, who was a refusenik and a dissident in the 1970s, deeply influenced by Dr. Sakharov's famous essay in 1968 on intellectual freedom. And he became Dr. Sakharov's spokesman in the mid 1970s, after which he spent nine years in prison and in the gulag uh, from 1977 to 1986. And in an article yesterday in the Washington Post, Natan Sharansky spoke of two dimensions of Dr. Sakharov's legacy that are relevant today the need for the world's democratic leaders to follow Sakharov's example by defending the right of oppressed people everywhere to think and speak freely, and also what he, the danger of what he calls double thinking, which he experienced in the Soviet Union and believes is, a, is, a, is spreading today uh, as a problem even in Western societies. So Tanan, Natan, could you explain to us why you think these issues are so relevant today? Natan? I was so just to mute myself. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, go ahead. No, okay, do you hear me now? Yeah, thank you, Carl. I have to say, after these very powerful words of Sergei Kovalev, I was thinking how in the days when Andrei Sakharov was receiving Nobel Prize and he couldn't go there, and Elena Bodder did. So he was in Vilnius. Why he was in Vilnius? Because there was a trial on Sergei Kovalev. And he felt that it is very important for him to stand in front of the court all the days of the trial. And I have to say, it was very typical of Andrei Sakharov. Whenever there was, uh, well, I, I was on uh, many of course, press conferences which I organized for Andrei Sakharov, and there he was explaining, he was making big effort, almost as a scientist, to explain to journalists why human rights is not simply moral choice, but why it is pragmatic choice. Why you cannot rely on those regimes which don't trust to their own citizens. And, uh, and he, he tried to build the real uh, theory of close linkage between the world stability and human rights. And at the same time, he was not only sir, speaking about theory. In practice, what he understood the most important practical thing is to fight for those dissidents who are now persecuted for their views. And whenever there was a trial, well, later it was my also trial. All five days of my trial, he was standing near my mother in front of the door. Nobody was, of course, would permit him to enter the court. But it was on numerous trials of the Jews, of Ukrainians, of Armenians, of Christians, uh, of uh, the Muslims, I mean, Tatars. He had, and why it was important, I can tell from my experience, 
whenever I was speaking with the journalists, that there will be trial against dissidents, they were asking, will Andrei Sakhal be there? If Andrei Sakhal will be there, then the world attention will be there. That what was important. And I remember one day uh, when uh, President Carter became the president, it was 20th of January, 1976. And I, I meet that on next day, I meet uh, American Jewish tourist who tells me that he has very good connections with the team of Carter. And if you want, if Sakharov wants, I can organize delivering the letter from Andrei Sakharov to President Carter. So I took him to Andrei Sakharov and uh, Elena Bonner, and I told them, we have one hour. Can we organize a letter to President Carter? And for, for one hour, we were all busy with writing this letter. You have to say 10 minutes, Andrei Sakharov was discussing with Elena Bonner about ideology of how to, to support Carter and his desire to put human rights at the top of the agenda. All the rest of the time, he was discussing who are those dissidents to whom we had to draw attention of uh, President of America. And he thought about, uh, practically about everybody who was in Gulag. He knew about fate of everybody. And then, then they decided it's impossible to put in one letter. And what they asked in this letter, the main thing in this letter was, President Carter, give us the channels through which we can regularly keep you informed about the fate of these dissidents. Can you say that uh, Tatiana is right mentioning President Reagan, who played tremendous role, tremendous role in supporting us and defeating the uh, evil empire. But you also have to remember President Carter with all our disappointments after this, but he was, not only he received the letter, he answered uh, through American embassy. In fact, suddenly the, the Sakharov was invited to American embassy and was given the answer of American president, like upgraded immediately all our relations between the dissidents and uh, the leaders of the Western world. And, but, and uh, then there was exchange of letters. The main idea was always for Andrei Sakharov. It's not a theory. Fight for those dissidents who are persecuted today. Put human rights at the top of your negotiations and you will see how it will bring us to better, more stable and more reliable relations between all the countries. And I couldn't help thinking when uh, Navalny went to Russia, and I was asked by some interviews in Israel, isn't he crazy? Does he, didn't he understand that he will be arrested? And I, I was very upset. I said, if, if you think that the aim of his life is to, to sit safely, yes, he's crazy. But he says, in fact, to all the citizens of Russia, I am not afraid why you are sh should be afraid. And we could see the results. But that's exactly was the power, the influence on Andrei Sakharov. He was not the first who became a dissident. But for people like me, to see that the person who is at the top, who are the, among the elite, among the leaders, who has all the privileges in the world. And I, like millions of the others, double thinkers, am trying to run away into the tower of science or the uh, ivory tower of science or art or professional perfection, and with this to try to find freedom, he is saying, you want to be free, you will never reach it by running away. You simply have to speak freely your mind, that's all. And with this, I think he had tremendous influence on all the generation of the, uh, the uh, of those citizens of the Soviet Union who understood that without speaking tr truly your mind, without fighting for human rights, we will never uh, be free. And that in fact changed the world. And of course today, today, the West, what the Western leaders can do uh, in the memory of Sakharov is speaking about Navalny when they're meeting with uh, Russian leaders, speaking about Hong Kong democratic dissidents when they're meeting with China, Speaking about Badaw, we had other distance people at their meeting with Saudi Arabia and so on. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Natan. And, uh, you know, for reminding us about uh, Sakharov's courage. And uh, it has been said by a number of people today that Navalny has, by his very name, has become a metaphor for courage. And the person we're going to hear from now, Vladimir Karamurza, is also 
uh, in a sense, a metaphor for courage. Uh, he is a Russian democracy activist, as everyone knows, an opposition leader, a writer, and a filmmaker. Um, but he, he has been poisoned twice uh, by uh, the Russian security services, uh, and yet he continues to go back uh, every week, back and forth uh, to Russia to continue uh, to work for uh, the realization uh, of Sakharov's uh, vision. Um, and Vladimir, uh, maybe, uh, you know, given what you've been through, uh, and the repression in Russia today is getting so much more severe. Um, what do you, why do you continue to believe uh, that there's hope in Russia today for the realization of Sakharov's vision? Thank you so much, Carl. And I want to, first of all, thank the National Endowment for Democracy for hosting this, this conversation on the Centennial Day. And, and can I just also say uh, how enormously honored I am by um, being in the same, uh, in the same event, in the same uh, dialogue as people like Lev Panamarev and Sergei Kovalev have been heroes of mine and continue to be ever since I was a child. Uh, and how uh, in awe I was just now to listen to Anatoly Sharansky and the great words he had to say both about the time of Sakharov, but also how this links and how unfortunately for all of us, there are so many striking parallels with the situation as it exists uh, in Russia uh, today. Uh, Natane Dilman, a prominent uh, Soviet Russian historian once said that uh, we are all just two handshakes away from the Decemberists. He was writing in the 19th 60s this, so I guess now we are three handshakes away. Um, unlike so many people um, uh, in this conversation, I like uh, Anatoly Sharansky, who personally for many years worked together with, with uh, Andrei Sakharov. Um, I didn't have the honor of knowing Sakharov personally. I was in second grade when he, when he passed away in 1989. But I am just one handshake uh, away uh, from him because um, I came into Russian politics more than 20 years ago now. Uh, together with and thanks to uh, Boris Nemtsov, uh, one of the most prominent leaders of the democratic movement, democratic opposition in Russia. And he, in turn, uh, came into active political life in many ways thanks to uh, Andrei Sakharov, his first sort of major gesture in, in public life in the late 1980s in the city of Gorky, of course, the same city where Andrei Sakharov and Yelena Bonner spent nearly seven years in, in forced internal exile in the 1980s. Uh, Boris Nemtsov's first big political gesture was to stop, uh, which was almost inconceivable at the time, but he succeeded in this, to stop the construction of a nuclear plant right next to uh, a big city with more than a million inhabitants. And this just two years after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. And the most decisive step in that successful campaign was the meeting uh, and the interview that Boris Nemtsov um, conducted with Andrei Sakharov in October of 1988, which was published in Gorky's biggest regional newspaper. This was already the time of Glasnost when such things were beginning to be possible. Uh, and there are photos from that meeting when they sit uh, in, in, in that kitchen. And um, uh, by the way, a very good friend of many of us here, um, Alexander Podrobinik, a prominent figure both in the Soviet dissident movement and, and still very active today. Um, he now lives in Andrei Sakharov's apartment on Zimlinoyval, uh, Chikalov Street. Uh, and so I had the honor to, to be in his kitchen just a few uh, just a few weeks ago. And I have to say, um, and it's so good to see Tatiana on this call. And I very much look forward to being able to meet uh, uh, in person soon. But it's, it's a feeling I cannot express in words to be able to sit in the kitchen where, uh, uh, where Andrei Sakharov and Yelena Bonner spent so many years of their life. And then a few years ago, I remember uh, Boris Nemtsov was um, picking uh, my wife and me up from, from that apartment. And he said, why should I pick you up from? Uh, and I said, I'm in, I'm in Sakharov's apartment. And he said straight away, uh, Chikalova number 48. He remembered that address uh, for many, many years since, since, he had that, since he had that meeting. It is both striking, powerful, but also very unfortunate that Sakharov's uh, words and his writings and his speeches from the 1960s and, and the 1970s ring so topical and so true uh, today, uh, nearly half a century uh, later. This is what he wrote in his famous essay in 1968, uh, his first major political essay, Thoughts on Progress, Peaceful Coexistence and Intellectual Freedom. Freedom of thought requires the defense of all thinking and honest people. It is the only guarantee against an infection of people by mass myths which in the hands of treacherous hypocrites and demagogues can be transformed into bloody dictatorship. And of course, this could have been written yesterday. Talking about Andrei Sakharov's life and, and his 
and his biography, it's probably going to be inconceivable for so many people, both in our time, but also in his time. Why would somebody um, who had the life of comfort and privilege, as he did, uh, as being as uh, Anatoly Sharansky just, just spoke about, he was part of the top academic elite, the youngest full member of the Soviet Academy of Science, somebody who was endowed with the greatest material benefits that were possible under Soviet uh, rule, you know, big apartment, chauffeur-driven car, access to exclusive stores, personal access to, to top Kremlin leaders, to give it all away voluntarily uh, and to exchange it all for the perilous existence uh, of a dissident in a totalitarian society. Um, I think one of the best explanations that I've, the best, the, the strongest, the most powerful explanation I've ever heard for why people would do this came from um, one of the people I filmed uh, for my documentary, They Chose Freedom. Uh, uh, Anatoly Sharansky is in that documentary. The late Elena Bonner is, un, is, a, is in that documentary. Um, and, and one other person who is in that documentary, uh, who is also unfortunately passed away, uh, was Natalia Gorbanevska. She was a, a poet. She was one of the seven people who in August of 1968 came out onto Red Square uh, in Moscow to protest against the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. And out of all the people in that demonstration, she paid the heaviest price. She wasn't put in a prison camp. She wasn't sent to a, a penal colony. She was put in a psychiatric hospital, in a Kazan special psychiatric hospital, and kept there in torturous conditions. Uh, one of the most horrific ways the Soviet regime used to target dissenters by, uh, by declaring them mentally insane and confining them to these asylums. And this is what happened to her. And so I asked her for that documentary why did you do this, knowing what price you would have to pay? Uh, she had two small children. The youngest, who was a couple of months old, was actually with her in a pram on Red Square uh, during that demonstration. And I will never forget what she, uh, what she responded. She said to me, going out to that demonstration was a selfish act. And I asked, what do you mean? And she said, I wanted to have a clean conscience. I'm not sure I fully grasped back then, this was more than 15 years ago when I spoke to her for this film just what she meant. But now today, as uh, the work of the opposition in Russia re resembles in so many ways, again, unfortunately, uh, what uh, Anatoly Sharansky and Yelena Bonner and Sergei Kovalev had to endure back in the 70s uh, and 80s, uh, I understand very well uh, what Natalia Gorbanevska meant. And I have to say that this is a very powerful motivation, speaking about Alexei Navalny, speaking about what all of us continue to do to the best of our ability. It is important to have a clean conscience because, because silence is complicity, because inaction is complicity. If you just stand by and watch what is being done by the people who claim to speak on behalf of our country and we do nothing about it, then we would feel uh, that we would be complicit and that is unacceptable. And this was, I know, the most powerful motivation for, uh, for Boris Nemtsov as well. Uh, you know, today, as we are marking this centennial, so many capitals around the world, uh, I know Paris, I know Oslo, I know others, are holding official exhibits and events to mark uh, this anniversary, to mark the birthday, to mark the centennial. The one glaring exception, of course, is Andrei Sakharov's native city, my native city uh, of, uh, of Moscow. A few days ago, um, the Moscow authorities, uh, officials at Moscow City Hall, have officially prohibited a photo exhibit that was supposed to be organized on Chisti Prudy, on Chistaprudny Boulevard, uh, in cooperation with the Sakharov Center. Uh, an official from City Hall uh, who spoke to Sakharov Center, to the organizers on the phone, said that the content has not been authorized. The content was supposed to be photographs of, of, of Andrei Sakharov with quotes from his writings and from his speeches. Content not authorized. It is, of course, needless to speak, uh, uh, shameful. But paradoxically, in a way, it's also quite appropriate uh, because I think, frankly, it would have been the height of hypocrisy to organize an official exhibit in honor of Andrei Sakharov at a time when state-driven political repression in Russia is as bad and in many ways worse than it was in his time. In his Nobel lecture that Yelena Bona read out in Oslo in December of 1975, he listed by name 126 prisoners of conscience and political prisoners in the Soviet Union to whom he dedicated his Nobel Prize. That was, of course, not a complete figure. These were the names that were known to him and the cases that were known to him. But today, according to the Memorial Human Rights Center that 
keeps and compiles a list of current political prisoners in the Russian Federation. And that is also an incomplete figure because those are only the cases Memorial has studied and only the cases that correspond to very strict Council of Europe definition of a political prisoner. According to them today, there are 383 political prisoners in Vladimir Putin's Russia today. The number is more than double uh, what Andrei Sakharov cited in his Nobel lecture in December of 1975, not to mention everything else that's going on, the dispersal of peaceful demonstrators, the state censorship and, and propaganda in the media, uh, the hounding and harassment of political dissidents, the lack of free and fair election, and of course, political murders, not just imprisonments, not just exile, exiles, but murders. Boris Nemtsov, whom Sakharov brought into politics in, in, in the late 1980s, was gunned down, as you all know, literally in the shadow of the Kremlin walls in the year 2015. Uh, and so I think it would have been uh, quite hypocritical in these conditions, in this situation, to have an official Sakharov uh, exhibit in Moscow. I know the day will come when Andrei Sakharov's time will come in Russia and when uh, our country will be worthy to have an official memorial, an official monument to Andrei Sakharov. There's still a decision that hasn't been rescinded, passed by the Moscow City Council in 1990, um, to uh, establish, a, uh, to put up a monument to Andrei Sakharov in Moscow. That decision is still not implemented. And uh, in the early 2000s, in the early years of uh, Vladimir Putin's rule, when the trends were already very clear, when it was very clear already which direction he was going to take uh, our country, uh, there was talk once again of the need to implement that decision and to, uh, and to put up a monument to Sakharov in Moscow. And Yelena Bonner, his widow, uh, his companion, his comrade in arms, came very strongly and publicly against that. And here's the statement she made. I'm going to quote one sentence from that statement. Uh, and then it is in Russian, so I'm going to translate as I read it. Uh, so she wrote, the decision to put up this monument was first taken a year after Sakharov's death. Uh, death. Then that decision was justified uh, because it was uh, appropriate given the uh, public memory and the popular memory for Sakharov in Russia. Today's Russia, where one third of the population lives below the poverty line, a Russia that is conducting a cruel war. Now, of course, then she was talking about Chechnya, but these words ring just as true with regard to Ukraine today. Uh, this Russia does not correspond to the idea of a monument to Sakharov. End of quote. And this is this is just a, 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 an immediate translation that I did from, from her statement. Well, I not only hope, but I know uh, that one day there will be a time uh, when uh, Russia is worthy to have a memorial to Andrei Sakharov in Moscow. I know that day will come. And I know that those young people all across our country who may not know much about Sakharov because, you know, nothing is being taught about him in schools and you'd have to make an effort to actually learn and find out who he was. But those young people who have been going, going uh, out on demonstrations all over Russia, uh, most prominently in January and again in April of this year, in spite of threats, in spite of arrests, in spite of beatings and detentions, just as those seven in 1968, but now it's tens of thousands of people. In many ways, these young people are unwittingly continuing the work and carry on the torch uh, that was lit by Andrei Sakharov all those years ago. I know the day when Russia will be worthy of him and his memory will come. And everything that we do in the democratic movement of today has as its goal, as its ultimate goal, to try to bring that day just a little closer. Thank you so much once again for the opportunity to speak, and I very much look forward to hearing uh, my very good friend, Professor Erwin Kotler, who, of course, knew personally and worked with um, Andrei Sakharov uh, himself. And Carl, thank you so much once again for putting together this conversation. Thanks, Vladimir. But before I call on Erwin, you mentioned Natalia, her two small children, why she did what she did. Uh, you have three small children, not, that, not so small anymore, um, and I know them. <laughs> Uh, you've been poisoned twice. You talk about political killings. Why do you go back? Speak for yourself now. Why do you go back regularly? Well, because I'm a Russian politician and a Russian politician has to be in Russia. It's as simple as that. You know, when, when Alexei Navalny woke up from his coma in Berlin uh, last September, and the first thing he said as soon as he regained his speech was that he's going to go back to Russia as soon as he's able to, I was literally inundated by calls from Western journalists asking me to comment on this sensation, quote unquote, as they put it, to which I responded in, in, in some sort of bewilderment, frankly, that not only don't I see any kind of sensation, I don't see any kind of news in this. He's a Russian politician. He has to be in Russia. He cannot be in. Uh, it cannot be any other way. I'm so grateful for 
uh, Anatoly Sharansky, what he just said now, and what I also read him say in the interview back then, also last year, that, you know, if your goal in life is to, I don't know, do some gardening or lead a nice, quiet life, then, yeah, then that may be crazy, but that's not what we do. That's not what we, why we are in this. I, I think the biggest gift those of us who are, who are in opposition to Putin today could give to the Kremlin would be to just give up and leave the country. This is all they want from us. They have come to the conclusion um, when Andropov was chairman of the KGB in the 1970s that the most effective way to silence political dissenters was not to imprison them or, or to put them in psychiatric hospitals, which of course they all did as well, but was to actually exile them uh, out to the West as they did beginning with Solzhenitsyn and then Bukowski uh, and then Ginsburg and Orlov and then Anatoly Sharansky in 1986 because in many ways, and they realize this very well, uh, uh, the people, the active political dissidents who um, who become, who are outside, who become detached from the country, who, who end up being outside of the country, they lose not only the sort of everyday feeling of reality, which is really important, obviously, but also they lose something much more important. They lose, uh, I think, the moral authority to continue because when a political uh, dissident is outside, um, I think they have much less of a moral right to continue doing what they're doing. And this, I mentioned Anatoly Sharansky as one of the people in that list. His case is different because, of course, he was originally uh, one of the leaders of the refusing Zionist movement. So he always uh, saw his future and his destiny in Israel, which he then uh, became a political leader. And but those people who were uh, specifically uh, in, 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 you know, in the domestic grown uh, Russian democratic movement, this was certainly relevant in their case, and this is still relevant today, and the Kremlin still understands it. And as you know, these new criminal cases announced were announced against Alexei Navalny while he was in Germany, with the goal that he does not come back, because this is all they want from us. You know, every time I return to Moscow, I go through passport control. I'm a Russian citizen returning to Russia. I spent about 30 minutes standing in front of that officer, because, you know, they have this scared look in their eyes where it's unless they see the computer. I'd, I'd give a lot to see what they have about me on that computer. Unfortunately, I can't because it's turned the other way. But, you know, they call someone, they run and speak to someone, they go and, 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 and see what they have to do. Of course, in the end, they stamp my passport and let me in. How can they not? But every time there's some kind of trouble when I go back, every time I fly out of Russia, it's five seconds, a stamp, get out of here. Well, you know what? We're not going to. It is our country, and we're not going to give it away to these scoundrels and murderers and crooks and KGB officers who are sitting in the Kremlin. There are millions of people in Russia who share our vision for a free and democratic society, who want Russia to become, to use the words of Alexei Navalny in one of his recent interviews before his arrest, a normal European country. There are millions of people in Russia who share that vision, and for their sake, we have no right to leave. We have no right to give up. We have no right to run away. We have to continue. So um, I'm very grateful to your question, uh, to, to you for the question, Carl. And I'm very grateful uh, to Anatoly Sharansky for explaining this, what really should be obvious, but it's actually bewildering why so many people even ask this question, because there is no other way we could, we could be doing this. Yeah. No, you call yourself a politician. That word doesn't have the best connotations in the West. Uh, we prefer to think of you as a kind of a moral authority or a hero. Well, we have um, Anatoly Sharansky and Erwin Kotler on, on this, on this yes, yes, conversation. Absolutely. They're both politicians yeah. and, they're, and, and they're both uh, right. beacons of, of this morality that Sergei Kovalev talks in. in like, his, like, Sakharov, like Sakharov, an example for all of us right. to the world. And Sakharov, of course, was a member of the Soviet parliament. So, so it's unjustifiable to, uh, to have yeah. this bad connotation. It depends on which politicians you're talking about. Exactly, exactly. Well, it's a model. <laughs> it's a model and an example for, for all of us. Erwin, you were in the parliament for almost two decades, so you are a kind of a politician although you're much more than that, and you were Minister of Justice in Canada as well, and Canada's leading human rights voice to the world. And you've also um, been counsel to numerous uh, prisoners of conscience, including uh, Dr. Sakharov. Uh, explain for us, Arwen, why you do that, but also, uh, I know you were in Moscow uh, in November of 1989, uh, visiting Sakharov, and then you were returning uh, to Moscow uh, in December to um, have dinner with him. Uh, on the 15th of December, he died the day before. Uh, tell us, Erwin, the purpose of these visits um, and uh, and then also about the funeral that you attended uh, since, you know, Sak you were there when Sakharov uh, passed away. Erwin. Thank you, Carl. I want to join others, uh, expressed appreciation to you and Ned uh, for organizing this very inspiring gathering uh, on this historical moment of centennial of 
Dr. Sakharov, I'm, I, I'm humbled to be here with Tatiana and, and Natan and, and Vladimir and, and others. It's a very uh, moving moment. Uh, I first visited uh, Sakharov in the apartment, as Vladimir mentioned, uh, and as you mentioned, on November 24th, 1989, uh, to discuss the questions relating to uh, human rights, human rights in the Soviet Union, political prisoners, and an emerging issue at that time, uh, the fate and whereabouts of uh, Rao uh, Wallenberg. Before we could start any discussion, I was accompanied by uh, Mikhail Shlenov, uh, himself a, a leading uh, Soviet uh, scholar. We had just formed an international commission on the fate and whereabouts of Rao Wallenberg. Before we could discuss anything, the phone rang. And on the phone was uh, Francisco Janusz, who was then one of the leaders of Charter 77 in Czechoslovakia, the human rights movement there. And he was excitingly calling to tell Sakharov that the Politburo in Czechoslovakia had fallen, that there were 250,000 celebrating in Venceslav Square, that Czechoslovakia was free. And Andrei Sakharov turned to Mikhail Shlenov, myself, and I, I can still see his face and tears in his eyes. And he said, I feel 21 years younger today. And the reason for that, of course, was because Andrei Sakharov had been at the forefront then of the movement for the Prague Springs, had condemned the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, had been the person who inspired the founding of the Helsinki Final Act in 1975, one of the most important of international human rights treaties, who spoke, as has been mentioned, at his Nobel Peace Laureate with regard to the freeing of uh, uh, political uh, prisoners, and who had, in fact, spoken about and then in behalf of the founders of the Helsinki Monitoring Group, like Natan Sharansky, who were then arrested and imprisoned for becoming founders of a Helsinki Monitoring Group authorized by the Helsinki uh, Final Act itself. And it was against this backdrop that I had my first visit with Andrei Sakharov in August 1979. That meeting was also a memorable encounter as Sakharov summed up in one pithy sentence a series of historical uh, events. And I can still you know, see it and hear it in my mind's eye. Uh, on the Helsinki Final Act, he said, the Helsinki Final Act was our human rights manifesto, but the Soviet Union has turned it into a prosecutor's club. On the trial of Anatoly Sharansky, he said, the trial of Anatoly Sharansky is the trial of Soviet jury. It is the trial of human rights in the Soviet Union. And then he added, Sharansky is each and every one of us. Sharansky represents us all. And then he added, when I say that, I don't mean he only represents each and every one of us here in the Soviet Union, but represents each and every one of us who struggle for human rights, whoever uh, we may be. And then uh, and another pithy sentence, and I'm reminded because of events today, he sp spoke about the issue of anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union at the time, and he said, anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union has been raised to the level of a state religion in a godless society. And so you see how he was summing up historical events, except in one uh, pithy sentence. I told uh, Sakharov at the end of our conversation that I was about to appear before a specially arranged uh, hearing in a Soviet court on behalf of uh, Natan Sharansky two days later, and that I would return to see him uh, after the trial. Uh, that never would happen. One day before the hearing, I was arrested, uh, detained, interrogated, and expelled from the Soviet Union, among other things, charged with consorting with the spies like Andrei Sakharov on behalf of a spy, Anatoly uh, uh, Sharansky. And so I did not get to see Andrei Sakharov, and he shortly thereafter, as Tatiana mentioned, was exiled with Elena Bonner. Their parents were, their parents were exiled to Gorky, and we in Canada then continued to advocate on behalf of uh, their release. In January 1988, uh, I was named to a, the first ever International Helsinki Federation of Human Rights delegation to visit the Soviet Union. At that time, Gorbachev was proclaiming the virtues of uh, glasnost and perestroika. But before our delegation could leave, we received notice that all the delegation could come except me because I was banned from the Soviet Union. 
interestingly enough, the delegation then said, we will not go unless I got the visa. And so I did get a visa. And on coming to the Soviet Union, January 1980, my first visit was to Andrei Sakharov. And the reason for that was to say to Andrei Sakharov to express and share appreciation to him for what he had been doing on behalf of political prisoners, for the release of, of Anatoly Sharansky, for his inspirational struggle for human rights in the former Soviet uh, Union, in the Soviet Union at the time. This brings us to that historic meeting that I referred to uh, on November 24th, 1989. That ended uh, with Sakharov surprising Mikha Shlenov and myself by telling us of his engagement in the search for Al Wallenberg, telling us that he had no doubt that Wallenberg did not die in 1947 as the Soviets claimed he did, that all that representation by the Soviet Union were false and misleading, and that he and Elena Bonner believed that in fact at that time, <clears throat> Rao Wallenberg was being held in a psychiatric clinic between Moscow and Leningrad. And he knew I was returning to the Soviet Union in December. And he said, we would, you know, uh, go to that place and pursue this uh, further. We invited Sakharov to be the guest speaker at that time at the founding conference of uh, Jews in the Soviet Union, which was to take place on December 20th. Sakharov expressed modestly uh, that he would be delighted to do so. I then uh, left flew on December 14th, landed in from Montreal, landed in London December 15th, called my wife and said, I'm just arriving in London on my way to Moscow. As you know, I'll be having dinner with Andre Sakharov this evening and, and with his wife, Elena Bonner. And my wife told me, you won't be able to have dinner with him this evening. I said, why did he have to cancel? She said, no, uh, he died of a heart attack uh, this morning. And so rather than being able to have dinner, I attended the funeral for Dr. Andre Sakharov which was one of the more moving events I have ever uh, participated in. One of the things, and I was reminded by what Vladimir was saying, there were people there with placards and signs saying, Andrei Sakharov, please forgive us. And when I spoke with them, it was because they said, we didn't stand up to support him when he was supporting us. And so we are saying now, please Forgive us for not standing with you. But Andrei Sakharov always stood for all the great causes, a relentless pursuer of human rights. And so when the founding conference of Jews in the Soviet Union was held, he could not be the guest speaker. As I said, he had passed away. So what we did is we inaugurated a lectureship called the Sakharov Wallenberg lectureship in human rights. And it was done in remembrance of two heroes of humanity, because that's how Dr. Sakharov referred to Raoul Wallenberg. That's how we referred to him. And I will close uh, just with the words, an excerpt very brief from what I said, because I was asked to give it that first inaugural uh, Wallenberg Sakharov lectureship. And I said that Andrei Sakharov is not only the conscience of the Soviet Union, that Andrei Sakharov is the conscience of humanity, that he has inspired us all in his relentless struggle for universal human rights, which he rightly sees as our shared humanity. And we are all his beneficiaries. And we remain today, Carl, on the centenary, all his beneficiaries. Thank you, Erwin, thank you so much. Erwin, you know, you mentioned being there in, at the end of 1989, and just a couple of years after that, Steve Began, who in January stepped down as the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, went to Moscow to open the office of the International Republican Institute in, um, in Moscow, uh, the IRI being one of Ned's core institutes. And Steve, uh, and Steve, I want to note, is a board member now of the National Endowment for Democracy. Steve, you arrived shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and you worked in partnership with uh, the Russian democratic movement that was inspired by Sakharov. What was the situation you found when you arrived in 92? And how did you feel the influence of Sakharov in the, in the post-Soviet uh, period in, 
in Moscow and in the Soviet Union? And what was the role of the US democracy building organizations at that time? And what can be done by such organizations moving forward? Steve Began. Well, thank you, Carl. And thank you uh, for everyone else who's spoken today. You know, I would describe my role in this saga uh, as much more of an observer than a partner, a participant. Uh, and in fact, uh, the best I could probably claim is, is a role as a partner. But, um, but I was always uh, myself inspired most by the examples of my Russian colleagues and counterparts during these many years that I've worked with Russia. You know, Carl, for me, it started in the mid 1980s as a college student at the University of Michigan, um, the proud alma mater of Raoul Wallenberg in a place that strove to keep the literary traditions of the dissident voices in the Soviet Union alive. I worked with many professors who were publishing the, the, the words of, of uh, the most inspiring voices calling for decency and human rights in the Soviet Union. And we were, we were inspired and taught the examples of people like Vladimir Bukowski and um, Svetlana, uh, uh, Ludmila Alexeyeva, of course, uh, Anatoly Natan Sharansky uh, was was and and also uh, Joseph Yagun, uh, uh, who with whom I shared a uh, familia and uh, who I had the chance to to have lunch with in Jerusalem just a few years ago. But of course, above all, uh, uh, all of us knew the example of of uh, Andrei Sakharov, and Sakharov's example extended well beyond uh, the borders of the Soviet Union. Uh, to even young people in America who aspired for a different future for the United States and, and the Russian people and, and, and for a world of peace. And we should never forget that as much as Andrei Sakharov was an advocate for human rights, he was also very much an advocate for peace. And he saw the two as inextricably linked. Um, when, I, when I took my uh, opportunity and had the privilege of, of moving to Moscow uh, with John McCain's uh, International Republican Institute. Um, we fairly soon found our place working with partners in the democratic movement across Russia. And, and, uh, and I have to say that it, it frequently it was the case that uh, the name of, of uh, Sakharov was invoked in our discussions, and not by us, but by our counterparts in Russia with whom we were working. And, and let me be absolutely clear that the Russia that I saw between 1992 and, and the end of 1994, um, this, was a, this was not a, simply a Moscow in St. Petersburg based democratic movement. The movement that was inspired by Sakharov spread the entire breadth of the country. I had uh, 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 the opportunity to lead a program of, of uh, Russian and American uh, specialists and in, 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 in some cases simply passionate supporters of a, of a more free and democratic future in Russia. And we traveled and met with counterparts who had an endless appetite for the future that Sakharov's example promised. Beyond Moscow, it included Voronezh, Lipetsk, rostov Nadanu, Krasnodar, Volgograd, Samara, Chelyabinsk, Nizhny Novgorod, Yekaterinburg, Yaroslav, Vladimir, Petrozovodsk, Severodvinsk, Arkhangelsk, Irkutsk, Novosibirsk, Tamsk, Kemerva, Barnaul, all these places we visited over those three years. And in each place, we found people st starving for contact with the world, in many cases still wounded from what they endured uh, in, in the uh, years of the Soviet Union. We were not trying to teach them democracy. We were not trying to convince them of the virtues of democracy. They had an endless appetite that drew us everywhere we went. Uh, and, and, uh, and in that era, uh, it was them who inspired us more than we inspired them. But it didn't work out. And I've asked myself many times, you know, from those three years, from 92 to 95, what happened? And, and uh, you know, the answer from my view is, is not complicated. The movement was very fragile. The push for democracy in Russia at that point uh, depended upon the bright light and leadership of people uh, like Sakharov. And when we lost him, we lost one of the strongest voices and examples uh, that we had in Russia to mobilize and lead the movement. There were many others 
There were many others who, who were side by side with him. Of course, his widow, Gillina Bonner, but so many others. Um, but the next wave of democratic leadership still uh, had not risen to the fore. And in that gap, in that fragile moment, the forces of reaction moved back in and charted the history that we've seen for more than two decades now. So Carl, um, your last question, you know, what to do? Uh, Sakharov uh, is famous for one of his quotes that if we simply accept human rights as just their way of doing things as we did, so many did during the Soviet days, then we're all guilty. So we all have to do our part in business, in the non-governmental sector. Um, the bravest voices are the ones who, who still travel uh, to Russia at the great risk that you described. Um, we, need to, we need to be that source of inspiration and partnership. It is not our job to bring democracy to Russia. That is the, the role of the Russian people. But as uh, fellow human beings and as, as uh, principled people who value human rights and peace, we need to be prepared at every moment to be partners with them. And so I wish that for, uh, for me and my countrymen. Um, and I, I cannot tell you how inspired I am to share this uh, conference today with so many other participants. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. And we're now going to hear from another um, important U.S. leader in foreign policy who is a member of the NED board, Dan Freed, uh, who's at the Atlantic Council, had a 40-year career in the Foreign Service, was ambassador to Poland. He played a key role in implementing U.S. foreign policy in Europe uh, after the Soviet collapse. Dan, You've said that Sakharov, uh, in his liberal and westernizing spirit, anticipated and helped pave the way for the democratic changes that at one time seemed ascendant in Russia and may return. Given the terrible conditions there today, Dan, how can you derive hope at this dark time for the revival of Sakharov's legacy? Dan. I look at Sakharov's life and work, and that provides the answer to your question. And, and there are four points to make. One, Sakharov believed in the universality of basic values. Universality, not an exception or carve out for Russians or Chinese or white men but universal values that apply to each individual human being. Two, he believed in the relationship between respect for human rights at home and peace abroad. That in fact, a country's internal arrangements had a relationship to its behavior in the world. Three, he believed that the moral choice was the most pragmatic choice in the end, which is a really hard principle for a career diplomat like myself to accept because diplomacy is not for purists. But in the long run, how do we remember Nixon's detente with Brezhnev and stack it up against Reagan's call for freedom? What looked better at the time and what looks better in retrospect? The moral choice in the long run may be the most pragmatic choice. And finally, Sakharov, huh, not the only one, but by his example, he told us to be not afraid. Be not afraid. And that is inspiring. Yes, those lessons need to be remembered, including by my fellow Americans today like maybe especially. I do not believe that Putinism is the inevitable fate or the apotheosis of Russian history. I acknowledge that I may be in the minority among American Russia watchers, but I do not believe that in the end, Sakharov was wrong. I think in the end he was right, but the arc of history is crooked. 
And Russia today has failed in it, the promise, but that is not a permanent verdict of history. How can we in the West dismiss the possibility of democracy and human rights in Russia when Russians themselves, like Vladimir Karamurza, put themselves at risk on behalf of these universal values? What kind of shallow cynicism do we want to lead our thinking? It may be that, the, that Putinism will not be followed by something worse. When I was a young student in Moscow, 20 years old, in the dormitories where I used to hang out, the discussion was sometimes of Sakharov or Solzhenitsyn, but many believed that after Brezhnev, things would only be worse, and they painted a dark picture of Russian nationalism. Somewhat similar to what we see now. But after Brezhnev, there was also Gorbachev. And Yeltsin, who was burdened by the trauma of the Soviet Union's political collapse, faced liabilities that the next Russian leader may not face. From the, you know, what did Vladimir Karamurza say? What, three handshakes away from the Decemberists? Right? Do not dismiss the possibility of better things. Remember that Sakharov was right. Values are universal. Human rights at home has an impact on a country's behavior abroad. The right choice, the moral choice is ultimately apt to be a more pragmatic choice and be not afraid. <laughs> Universal lessons, I fear, and we need them too. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. And we're going to finally hear from uh, Miriam Lanskoy, um, who oversees the NEDS programs uh, in uh, Russia uh, and Eurasia. Um, Miriam is also a scholar in 2010. She co-authored with uh, the Chechen foreign minister at the time, uh, at least before 2005, Ilya Sakhmatov, uh, the book, The Chechen Struggle, Independence Won and Lost. Um, Miriam, I know you've been in touch very closely with people. You moderated a discussion yesterday about the situation in Russia. These are tough times in some ways equally as tough as 1970s and before Gorbachev in the 1980s uh, in, the, uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, tell us, Miriam, you know, not only about the difficulties, but, uh, you know, but why you take some hope. You, you alerted me today, this week, about the trial of Olga uh, Misik, uh, the young girl with the constitution who in, you know, 2000, uh, July of 2019, she marshaled uh, you know, she just read the constitution of Russia sitting in the street, surrounded by Russian security forces, so worried about protests against the restriction on democratic freedoms uh, in Russia. And this week was her trial uh, for that crime of reading the Russian constitution. Miriam, tell us why you both are so concerned, but also, you know, why the work that our Russian friends continue to do uh, may eventually bear fruit. Oh, thank you, Carl. Thank you so much um, for, for, for hosting this. It's uh, incredible uh, to be here. It's deeply moving, and uh, I'm humbled uh, by, by all of you. Um, I, I want to say, first of all, that um, you know, I want to pick up on this theme that Vladimir raised of being just two handshakes away from the Decemberists and how the activists today um, really, the, the previous gen, their, their genetic hairs of, of, of those generations, it's imprinted in them. And listening to Natan Sharansky and some of the, um, the ways that uh, people were working back in the day have been coded into uh, the, the activists now. And even, you know, whether they make 
conscious reference uh, to Sakharov, these values and these ways of supporting each other are very much um, they're, they're the, 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 the rules of engagement, the way you approach human rights work um, and activism. And um, uh, speaking of, of Olga Misik, uh, so she's, she became iconic in the 2019 protest. She's a 17 year old girl sitting down reading uh, to like an army of Amon dressed as, you know, the, the, the you know, they look like robots or cosmonauts or something. And she's reading to them from uh, the constitution, the article on freedom of association and assembly. Uh, and she, she was just um, convicted uh, for two years of house arrest for uh, a, a protest in support of other young people who were in jail. And she wanted them to know that she was supporting them and was outside of the prison. And for that, she is now under house arrest for two years. And this brings, um, and, and she made a beautiful, beautiful closing statement in which she told the court that they cannot forbid youth and they cannot forbid love and was very, very beautiful. And you know, I don't know to what degree she um, consciously following Sahar. But these themes resonate among many, many young people. There were 10,000 people um, arrested in January following the January protests. There are um, now, so Navalny's database was hacked and people who contributed or were involved, uh, their names became public, they're being fired. So you have workers on the Moscow Metro. So all sorts of people, as it turns out, have been involved. So um, uh, 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 the, the themes of kind of courage and standing up for one another, um, but also the state's um, need to isolate people. And I think of um, uh, the Gorky exile and the fear that Sakharov would speak to others, right? The trying to break through that. What are, what are conditions of house arrest for people lately? And it's a lot of them. It's people who would have um, potentially been Duma candidates. People like Sobol or Galyamina, they can't be on the internet. <laughs> it's trying to isolate them from social media, from contacts, because they are so influential. Um, but again, the, the circles now are much wider. Um, ways of helping, you see people making donations, you see crowdfunding on behalf of prisoners, crowdfunding on behalf of organizations, that's very strong. Um, and you see or, people organizing to help one another, to deliver packages, to um, uh, protest outside of courthouses and so forth. So there's um, all kinds of solidarity um, aimed at, you know, again, overcoming the isolation and the feelings of futility that people who are being repressed um, might feel. But they, they, um, they make remarkably uh, powerful statements of resilience and of hope and of humor. Um, Navalny's statements from prison, you know, he he's, continues to mock them constantly. He, his use of a positive image of what Russia can be and simply mocking the authorities is very, very powerful. Um, and then finally, what I, I think is so important about Sakharov and um, sometimes um, it sometimes can be very controversial among, um, among the people who, who uh, work on human rights is um, his participation in politics and his willingness to go into the Congress of People's Deputies and his willingness to engage politically, um, this is really important. And that's an important model that is also um, now being repeated where people, um, uh, where, whereas sometimes in human rights circles, it's considered more appropriate to stand back that politics is by definition dirty. 
and we represent, if you, if you work on human rights, you represent eternal and, and general uh, truths and values. And you shouldn't, don't take part in, in partisan politics. Um, whereas now, and I think for Safarov as well, you, you, bring, you bring those values into politics and, and politics needs that. And um, I, what, I, what I really admire about these um, young people in Russia now who, who are trying to stand for local office and are trying to be active even at a small level in their communities is their willingness to take enormous risk um, and their faith that you can bring um, democratic and, and, and human rights values even into Russia's politics today. I think that's enormously encouraging. Thanks, Miriam. Um, you know, we only have a little bit of time left. I wanna pose one question uh, to everyone and people can uh, answer it. You know, we, we're thinking about the legacy of Sakharov, um, but, you know, authoritarians, dictators, they, they learn lessons too. Um, and, uh, you know, the lesson they learned from Gorbachev, and this Xi Jinping has said this openly, the lesson they learned from Gorbachev is if a leader tries to act on these, try to implement these values more of openness um, and so forth, the regime collapsed. Um, and the lesson taken by Xi Jinping and uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, the leaders in Cuba, Lashenka in um, Belarus, uh, and certainly Putin, uh, is that the only thing you can do is to tighten up. Um, and so, you know, and even in the case of China, they tighten up with the surveillance state and, and it, things are just worse than they've ever been. The question is how to respond to that, you know, both inside uh, these countries and the movements and outside by people like us. How do you respond to that really tough, tough situation when it's not just a matter of expressing values uh, but it's a matter, matter of developing strategies uh, and, and resilience to try to carry on. Natalia, do you want to try to take a stab at that? And then I want to hear from uh, Vladimir and, and the others. Please go ahead. Natalia, you want to unmute? If not, Vladimir, do you want to take a stab at that? And, and Tatiana, if you want to, you can as well. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, oh, there you are, Natan. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, you say that uh, uh, that uh, regime is afraid that it will collapse if it will go ahead with the reforms. What we see, and that's true for practically for every dictatorship, the longer it exists, the more energy it has to spend to control its own citizens, because the number of double thinkers is growing all the time. And the number of the internal dissidents who are not yet ready to cross this line. And here, the role of the free world uh, is, is really big and it's not accidental that people now with their voices from the Russia were saying how much depends uh, on the free world. Uh, the problem is not that dictators or the leaders in the authoritarian regimes are going back to decide that they have to keep stability. That's why they are against democracy. The problem is that free world is giving them a free pass. Today, it's much more difficult to bring back human, the issue of human rights uh, as a part of uh, negotiations with any authoritarian regime than it was in the, time, in the days of Andrei Sakharov or us. Yes, it's true that for this we had to, to risk our own freedom, but the world was responding. The fact that it is so difficult today to convince the free world, the, the plight of Uyghurs, the whole people who are kept in the concentration camp is very important for your relations with, with, with China and all the conversations how not to let China economically to conquer us. And that's why we need to have a real politics of agreeing how we divide markets and so on is ridiculous. Uh, you're, uh, it is, in fact, the free world is helping today to China in order to have it as a reliable partner in economical future to, to do whatever they want 
with the whole pe people, with the whole cultures, the whole religions. In fact, the, the pressure, uh, well, China was clever enough uh, where, where they didn't follow the Soviet example. They gave some freedom to the citizens. They, they gave them a freedom of economical initiative. That decreased some pressure. But otherwise, the pressure constantly grows. Just now we saw a year ago what's happening with Hong Kong. And all the sympathy of the free world was there. Now all the leaders of Hong Kong, uh, this movement, are arrested. And it's, it's not a topic in the, all the strategy how we are building relations uh, with China. So uh, I do believe that uh, the, uh, all the authoritarian regimes are very unstable, but it depends from the free world, whether the free world is ready to ch challenge this instability, because in, in fact, it will be, be destroyed only from inside, for, by, by the people who don't want to continue the life of double secrets. But to what extent the, this, uh, the power of these people from inside will be felt depends to what extent free world is ready to make them their allies. So uh, I don't think that our main problem is that dictators became wiser. Our main pro problem is that the free world is again and again with every opportunity goes back to so-called re real politique. And Andrei Sakharov, uh, uh, proved it. I remember how many times he was proving it as a side of the journals that in the end, the real politics is a suicide politic. Thanks, the time. Vladimir, do you want to try your hand at that um, and maybe also see if there are any parallels today with Putin and the period of Brezhnev, you know, before Gorbachev emerged? Thank you so much, Carl. Thanks for the question. Well, um, uh, this is a theme that has been uh, uh, sort of coming from, from the uh, remarks of every participant in this conversation today. Change can and should only come from the inside. Nothing can or should uh, be imposed, um, you know, from, from elsewhere. Only Russians uh, can and should, and I may add, will uh, bring ch democratic change to our country. I have no doubt that this is going to happen because... You know, the trends are very clear. We've been talking so far about sort of the official side of things, the repression, the political prisoners, the political murders, the dispersal of peaceful demonstrators and so on. But let's not forget that all of this is coming from a position of weakness by the Putin regime, not from a position of strength. You know, Putin's party is down to 27% nationally in the polls and down to 15% in Moscow, one five. That is shameful for a dictator who controls all the national media, all the political system, all the levels of power. 15% in the capital city and 27% nationally. If you look at the, uh, especially at polling among younger voters, uh, support for Putin is down to 20%, 80% of the young people of Russia who have never seen any other leader in their lifetimes because he's been in power for so long, uh, are opposed to the continuation of this. And, and so it's, it's no wonder the regime is so afraid and terrified, uh, especially of Alexei Navalny and his smart voting so-called initiative, tactical voting initiative, as we are uh, only three and a half months away from from parliamentary elections. So it's important when we talk about all these repressions, it's important to remember that this is a sign of weakness. It is an agony in a way. It doesn't mean it's gonna be short. Agonies can last a long time sometime, but I, uh, I have absolutely no doubt uh, that this growing public movement, an overwhelmingly young movement, I may add, uh, will prevail. You know, when, when we had these big nationwide protests in January um, after Navalny's arrest, by the way, the largest, quote unquote, unauthorized demonstration since the end of the Soviet Union, since the late 80s, early 90s, when hundreds of thousands of people went out to the streets and all across the country, by the way, not just as Steve Began was mentioning, it's a very important point, not just Moscow and St. Petersburg, everywhere from the Baltic Sea to the Pacific Ocean, literally it's a nationwide movement. There were some snap um, surveys conducted showing that the median age of those protesters is 31. This is the future of Russia. It's not just a nice figure of speech, it's a statement of fact. So I'm, I'm very optimistic, uh, sort of not even in the long term, but in the medium term. Uh, and what's very important too, and I remember I was commenting to, to journalists when we were all standing on, on Manezhne Square on, on the 21st of April, just a few weeks ago, in this latest round of, again, quote unquote, unauthorized demonstrations, uh, when there were tens of thousands of people and you know somebody asked, well, do you think it's... Uh, is this enough? Is this enough people that, that who turned out? And I said, well, you know what? In August 1968, there were seven people. 
and they turned out to be right. And they turned out in the end to save the honor of the entire nation. Now we have tens of thousands. And in the end, as Andrei Sakharov himself wrote, it is not a question of arithmetic. When he was asked about this, that why are there only a few thousand active dissidents in the Soviet Union, a country of 300 million people? He responded, it's not a question of arithmetic. It's a qualitative fact, the breach of the psychological barrier of silence. Every one of those hundreds of thousands of young Russians who are coming out to the streets are breaching that psychological barrier of silence, of propaganda, of repression, everything that the Putin regime represents. But just one word also on something uh, very important, profoundly important that Anatoly Sharansky was just speaking about, the position of the free world. Again, it's not for any Western countries to interfere and to meddle into Russian politics. Only we can do this from the inside. The only thing we do ask of our Western friends and partners of the democratic nations of this earth is to actually stand true to your own values, to practice what you preach. And to not, for example, enable the corruption, kleptocracy and authoritarianism of the Putin regime by giving Kremlin oligarchs free access to Western banks, Western financial institutions, Western jurisdictions. This is why the Magnitsky sanctions are so important, the targeted personal sanctions, not against Russia, as the Kremlin propaganda claims, but against specific crooks, abusers and kleptocrats who want to steal in Russia and then stash away and spend that stolen money, that loot uh, in Western countries, Western banks. Western financial institutions. This should stop. Uh, it's, it's really heartening to see so many democratic nations pass this legislation. It's important that it be implemented properly. And it, I think it's, there's an important role in civil society in making sure in keeping their own governments in the West, uh, holding them to implementing that legislation properly and to stop this tacit enabling and tacit complicity, which is what it is in my, in my view. And secondly, I think it really is time to go back to that long and noble tradition of American presidents of both political parties personally and directly advocating for prisoners of conscience and political prisoners. I do not think that Anatoly Sharansky would have been released in 1986 had it not been for sustained personal advocacy from President Ronald Reagan. Uh, Reagan famously made a condition of going to the Reykjavik summit with Gorbachev in 1986 uh, that Yuri Orlov, the, the founding chairman of the Moscow Helsinki group, be released. And he was. And every American president going back to somebody as unlikely as Richard Nixon, who, who secured the release of Vladimir Dremluga, another one of the seven people who were on Red Square. And then Gerald Ford, whose administration negotiated the release of Vladimir Bukowski. And then President Carter, who negotiated the release of Alexander Ginsburg and Plushin Moroz and these uh, dissidents who were exchanged in 1979. And then, of course, famously, prominently, very publicly, President Ronald Reagan. We need to go back to this tradition because the situation is as bad now domestically as it was in the time when they were advocating for those prisoners of conscience. And so if the summit meeting between US President Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin does take place over the course of June, as is being talked about, first of all, personally, I don't think it's a good idea to lend these dictators this legitimacy by giving them these photo opportunities with the leaders of the free world. But if the summit does go ahead, I think the very least that President Biden has to come out of that summit with is the release of at least a few of the 383 people who are currently on the list of political prisoners in the Russian Federation. Yes, Navalny is certainly uh, Navalny is yeah. certainly one of those uh, people. Navalny is one of them. Alexei Pichugin, the longest serving political prisoner in Russia, last prisoner of the Yukos case, 18 years in prison. Yuri Dmitriev, the historian from Memorial, who today was awarded the Andrei Sakharov Freedom Prize by the exactly. Norwegian Helsinki Committee, and hundreds of others, other people who would be here for three hours if you were just to mention every single name on that right. list. Yuri Dmitriev, I think we all have to note that, uh, that he got the Sakharov Award today from the European Parliament. He's a historian of the Gulag. He's in prison for being a historian. The Norwegian, the Norwegian Helsinki Committee. It's the Andrei Sakharov Freedom Award from the Norwegian Helsinki Committee. And because of the COVID restrictions, the ceremony has been moved to uh, October the 29th, symbolically one day before Political Prisoner Day uh, in Russia. So that's when they'll be holding the ceremony. And either his daughter or somebody, because of course he's incarcerated, will, will be accepting the award on his behalf. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, you talk about the responsibility of political leaders. And three of our panelists today, Erwin, Steve, and Dan, all played leading roles in their countries. We don't have much time left, so we're going to have to be short. But if the three of them could just speak briefly on what can the West do uh, in this very, very difficult situation. Steve, then Dan, then, uh, excuse me, Erwin, then Steve, then Dan. Erwin, go ahead. Okay, you know, uh, <clears throat> Miriam and, and Dan Freed, uh, I think taught, we're talking about what Sakharov taught us to uh, engage politically and not be afraid. And I've been encouraged uh, by 
people, young people, particularly who've been engaging themselves in Belarus, in Iran, in, in Hong Kong, in, in Venezuela, and of course, uh, in, in, in Russia. And in particular, many women uh, amongst uh, those protesters and leaders, and regrettably, more of these women being imprisoned, like Iran and elsewhere. And Vladimir is right that repression is a weakness, but we cannot do anything about that weakness unless we engage ourselves in the West and not allow uh, the political protesters and political prisoners of today to stand alone. And what worries me is that the struggle for human rights, the struggle for political prisoners who are the looking glass uh, into uh, this repression that Vladimir spoke about, that is not on the foreign policy radar screen. That is not a priority for the uh, Western world and the like. And so what I'm looking to see at this point is for leaders, Biden in the States, Trudeau in Canada, Macron in France, etc. They have to make the struggle for human rights, the defense of political prisoners, a priority as a matter of principle and as, and as a matter of policy. Thanks, Erwin. Steve, give us your view. Yeah, thanks, Carl. I, you know, I think uh, it, it's, it's fairly simple is that we can't give up. Uh, we, can't, uh, we can't become fatigued. We can't uh, rationalize uh, what we see happening. Uh, we, uh, we have to remain true. As long as a, a single Russian of conscience is fighting to create a system that in their own country, for their own people, is more just, we need to be their supporters. If we can go tra travel to Russia and partner with them, then we should. But the regime won't allow that today. If we can partner with them outside of Russia, then we should. The regime has recently made that illegal. If necessary, we simply need to shout it from the mountaintop, but we don't need to give up. And the, the trend toward repression that, that you spoke of uh, at the beginning of this uh, Q&A session, Carl, I shouldn't discourage us. Um, I think there's plenty of circumstantial evidence to suggest that President Putin's last several years has been a search for an exit that even he knows that this is unsustainable. His efforts to seek immunity, to find a successor, uh, to the shifts in the constitution, all point in my view uh, in the direction of a leader who, who harbors the hope of leaving office vertically instead of horizontally. And, and I think we should take encouragement from that as well. Um, so don't give up, that's, that's our job. Thanks so much, Steve. Dan? I agree with Steve, and I want to thank him for holding up the banner of values in his time as Deputy Secretary under, let us say, less than ideal circumstances. Bravo. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. So wrote William Lloyd Garrison, the great American abolitionist in the opening editorial of his newspaper, The Liberator. We cannot determine the outcome in Russia, but we do not have to be silent. We need, the, the Biden administration has started to frame up a Russia policy in which democracy is an important part, but we need to mean it. We need to mean it. That means talking about it, shining a light on it and supporting the programs which, which help freedom of thought inside Russia. Okay, that, that means being serious about those programs, remembering who, what we stand, what we Americans stand for at our best and be consistent. And you don't know how speaking out affects people. So, you know, I remember talking to a Polish minister, you know, a few years ago who was in prison when he heard of Ronald Reagan's statement that the Soviet Union was an evil empire. Many in Europe and in Western Europe and the United States recoiled in horror. But this guy said, all of us, all of the political prisoners in, in, under in Jaruzelski's prison understood that the Americans got it and we didn't feel alone anymore. They get it. The Americans get it. 
speak out, speak the truth, and be able to maintain our support for human rights, even as we cooperate with Putin in some discrete areas, we can figure out how to do both, right? Best Soviet policy we ever had. We can do this. We just have to mean it. Thanks, Dan. Miriam, um, if you want to give a reflection on that and if and Tatiana, if you're still around, you know, uh, I don't know that you are, but you can have a, a closing word. But Miriam, let us have your thoughts. Um, I guess I would just, <laughs> I, I, I would echo what Dan said. Um, there were Russian, young Russian people holding up at, at the April 21st um, protests, holding up the quote from Biden that Putin is a killer. Um, and they were similarly um, encouraged to see um, a US president speaking very plainly um, about these issues. Um, I think people are somewhat discouraged with the lifting of the sanctions on Nord Stream and that poses and there's a question in the in the comments from Catherine Fitzpatrick saying um, how, how do we go forward and realizing that if Biden has a summit, um, I guess some of the thoughts I'm hearing if Biden has a summit and Europeans will seek to follow that if we've lifted these sanctions and you know we, we go into a summit without really um, very much from the other side, um, some of that initial momentum might be compromised. And I think that's a worry that uh, some people are, are expressing now. Um, if he was to adopt something like what Vladimir talked about, which is, um, you know, uh, uh, the release of prisoners uh, ahead of a summit, maybe some of that impression could be mitigated. Yeah. Okay, Miriam. Uh, Tatiana, are you still there or is Tatiana gone? Yes, yes, yes I, am. I am. Okay, go ahead, Tatiana. And, uh, I actually uh, raised my hand a couple of times. Uh, I, I, well, first of all, thank you all very much for uh, most uh, enlightening and I would say you know, we're encouraging uh, discussion, but uh, I want to be, uh, to kind of bring us uh, back a little bit to our, to, to the rea today's reality. I'm happy that uh, uh, Miriam uh, uh, responded uh, in the manner of speaking uh, to Kathy Fitzpatrick's very valid and very troubling question. Uh, and so to bring us back to the reality, I admire the, uh, the enthusiasm and the devotion of uh, Valoisy Paramursa uh, at great risk to his own uh, personal safety and even life. Uh, but uh, you need to remember that um, in the past, when Western leaders were effective in, uh, um, uh, in persuading the Soviet leaders uh, uh, to um, uh, do concessions in the area of human rights, that the Soviet leaders were more interested in being accepted in the world community than I think the, um, uh, the present um, administration, you know, the, the last uh, 21 years uh, of Vladimir Putin is. Uh, he seems to be bent on alienating Russia uh, from, uh, from the community of nations and in fact takes great pleasure in, uh, in uh, offending every universal value that we were speaking of and uh, definitely universal uh, human rights, um, um, violating universal human rights uh, of uh, his citizens. So I, 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 we need to be realistic to be effective and I'm not trying to be pessimistic. I want to remind uh, that Sakharov always was a pessimist. Uh, I'm sorry, Sakharov always said that he was an optimist even when he, uh, when he painted, uh, when he gave his view of the current situation, which seemed to be extremely pessimistic to his Western audiences but he remained an optimist. And uh, also I want to remind us that uh, everything is good in its own time. And the fact that uh, the regimes uh, 
collapsed uh, that were mentioned here, the one including uh, Soviet Union, was a result of too little to leave, including Mikhail Gorbachev. Sakharov has been warning about these uh, pitfalls that eventually would bring the regime down uh, from uh, beginning from the early 1970s. So uh, 15 years before the beginning of the historical, he was warning about what would happen if the Soviet Union does not uh, change its ways and what what is in store for the regime such as this. And of course, this has fallen on deaf ears, even though some of his ideas were uh, implemented, such as the, the um, his his efforts on behalf of the um, of uh, the restriction of nuclear tests uh, became these were successful efforts in nineteen. 63, the Moscow test ban treaty has been concluded. So to some degree, you know, the Soviet authorities were able to listen to his advice, but not in many other respects. And therefore, when Gorbachev came, Sakharov tried to help him in every possible way, but Gorbachev was not willing to listen, even though he did uh, have uh, a degree of respect and possibly some um, some uh, uh, hunch as to what uh, uh, what uh, what an important uh, figure uh, Sakharov is and uh, what his role could positive role could be within the uh, the construct of the Soviet Union, but it was too too little and too late, and Sakharov's uh, constitution draft of constitution was not really. Um, uh, 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 followed or even read uh, in in earnest. I keep remembering uh, the episode when uh, Sakharov, after the first uh, Congress of People's Deputies, because he was a member of Constitutional Committee, he said uh, to Gorbachev, Mikhail Sergeyevich, uh, uh, when are we going to discuss the draft? And uh, he worked on the draft throughout the entire uh, summer of 1989, uh, um, and uh, uh, it has fallen on deaf ears. Gorbachev said, oh, Andrei Dmitry, don't worry. Now will be summer vacation. We will come back to it in the fall. Uh, you can see how uh, uh, little details like this can uh, undermine the most important endeavors. And it did undermine the Soviet Union, because there may have been a chance if it became a confederation that it might have survived in this shape or another with uh, different guiding principles. So, you know, let's, uh, let's learn from the past and try to apply it to the present so we may have a better future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatiana. And thank you for, you know, on an occasion like this, you know, we not only reflect on Sakharov, also on your mother, who was a beloved friend of ours. Uh, we miss them very, very much. You know, one of the messages that I take from a lot of what people are saying here is that the answers are not very complicated. They're, they're pretty simple, you know, having to do with not giving up, having to do with having courage, having to do with having um, solidarity. Um, and I, you know, I note that, uh, uh, three years ago, Natan uh, wrote an article uh, in the New York Times on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the publication of Sakharov's famous essay on progress, coexistence, and intellectual freedom. And he said that uh, Sakharov's decency, his decency made him a moral compass orienting not just the East, but also the West. Something as simple as human decency um, is really, in a sense, what is at the core of the, the struggle for freedom in the world. Decency, obviously uh, not giving up uh, both in the East and in the West, if we can still use those terms, North and South, this is a global struggle. Um, and Sakharov remains uh, a guiding force. Um, you know, 32 years after his death, Sakharov remains a guiding force in this global struggle for freedom. So I want to thank everyone for taking part in today's event, uh, our speakers, uh, Tatiana, everyone who uh, listened and, and took part in this process. 
obviously we think about Lev Ponomaryov and uh, Sergei Kovalyov as we uh, as we close. Um, this is a long and a difficult struggle, but you know there's no choice but to uh, to engage in this struggle. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Natan.